Welcome to the CanCare Ombudsman Liaison Training. The CanCare Ombudsman Office is here to help Kansas Medicaid applicants and members and those who assist them to navigate the system and resolve their CanCare issues so that they can get and keep their CanCare services. Today we'll be doing an overview of the programs for the elderly and persons with disabilities. In this lesson, we'll specifically be covering the seven home and community-based waiver programs, um, or HCBS waivers, and we'll also be talking about how to calculate the client obligation, which is the monthly cost share for each of those programs. We're just going to be touching lightly on each of these subjects today, but you can find more in-depth resources and educational materials on the CanCare website in the Ombudsman section. You can go directly to that section um, with that link you see. It's www.cancareombudsman.ks.gov. Uh, and again, at the end of this video, we'll provide clear instructions on how to get any of the resources we mention in this video. To apply for any of the seven HCBS or home and community based services programs, these are also called waiver programs, you can use the CanCare application for the elderly and persons with disabilities. This application is used to apply for programs for persons who are over 65 or persons of any age who are determined blind or disabled by the Social Security rules having um, a determination of SSI or SSDI, or number three, those individuals with a pending disability case with the Social Security Administration. So someone that has recently applied for disability determination and they have that pending case, or someone who has been denied a disability determination by Social Security and they are actively appealing that disability case denial. Uh, this application is also used for individuals applying for nursing facility and the PACE programs. The program we're going to cover now from the Elderly and Persons with Disabilities Can Care application is the Home and Community Based Services or HCBS waiver programs. What is an HCBS waiver? It's a can care program that provides services to a person in their home and community rather than in an, in an institutional setting, such as a nursing home or state hospital. HCBS is an alternative to hospitalization or institutional type of long-term care. If you or a loved one needs assistance to be able to remain in your home and community, then an HCBS waiver may be able to help you. Kansas currently has seven different HCBS waiver programs, each with a different set of rules. The Autism Waiver, the Frail Elderly Waiver, the Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Waiver, the Physical Disability Waiver, Serious Emotional Disturbance, or SED Waiver, the Technology Assisted Waiver, and the Brain Injury Waiver. We will just touch on each of these HCBS waiver programs today, but you can check out the resources at the end of this video for a more in-depth look at each waiver program. Home and Community-Based Services, or HCBS services, help with things such as meal preparation, assistance bathing and dressing, daily living activities, uh, medication reminders, community activities, help you find and keep a job and more. Um, the services you get are going to vary depending on the waiver you qualify for and also will vary depending on your individual needs. Uh, HCBS services do not pay for living expenses or room and board. In other words, uh, HCBS does not cover rent. Okay, so it's a medical assistance program, so it's only going to cover um, medical type services, things that are keeping you safe in the home and community. So if you are living in an assisted living uh, facility, for example, you might get the FE waiver, which is one of the HCBS programs. Um, the FE waiver is going to pay for many of those services where the person comes into your um, residents and assist you in bathing and dressing, medication reminders, etc. But it's not going to pay the rent at the assisted living facility. 
The Frail Elderly Waiver, or the FE Waiver, serves ages 65 and older. It's for Kansas seniors who want community-based services as an alternative to nursing home care. So instead of uh, going into the nursing home and receiving those services there, you can remain in your own home and, or in the community, for example, an assisted living facility, and you can receive those services there instead. Um, at the end of this video, we do give you clear instructions on how to find the different resources that we've mentioned throughout the video. There are some uh, fact sheets. There's one fact sheet for each of the seven HCBS waivers that pretty much covers all the frequently asked questions about each waiver. And we will show you again at the end of this video how to find those fact sheets. Uh, for example, those fact sheets tell you how much do you pay out of pocket for HCBS services. That's called a cost share. How much is your cost share for that program? How is that cost share calculated? What type of services and what are the definitions for each of the uh, offered services for each waiver? How you will be assessed for the waiver? Who do you contact for different questions you have about those services? All of those questions are answered on the individual, uh, on the seven individual HCBS fact sheets. The physical disability or the PD waiver serves ages 16 through 65. Those who meet the level of care criteria for nursing facility placement and need assistance to accomplish the normal tasks of daily life um, are potentially eligible for the physical disability waiver. Uh, an age care clarification on this, you don't age out at the age 65. You can continue um, once you turn 65 if you're already on the waiver uh, and you still qualify functionally for that waiver but you must be no older than age 65 to apply. Um, also, a note on uh, whether or not you must have a social security disability determination. If you're not already um, on SSI or SSDI, the consumer must apply for a social security disability determination of SSI or SSDI if 19 years of age or older and applying for one of the following waivers, the brain injury waiver, the physical disability waiver, or the IDD waiver, uh, intellectual developmental disability waiver. Prior to the 19th birthday, you don't need a social security disability determination when seeking HCBS services. But once you've hit 19, you do have to um, get that SSI or SSDI determination in order to get a waiver. Or at the very least, you need to have a pending case with Social Security Disability in order to um, be potentially eligible for one of those three waivers. Again, those three waivers are the Physical Disability Waiver, the PD Waiver, or the IDD waiver, Intellectual Developmental Disability waiver, or the BI waiver, the Brain Injury waiver. The Intellectual and Developmental Disability, or IDD waiver, serves ages five or older for those individuals who meet the definition of intellectual or developmental disability. Services uh, on this waiver are designed to help people with intellectual or developmental disabilities maintain their physical and mental health in their home and community. Uh, reminder, this is one of those waivers. If you are 19 years of age or older and applying for this, uh, you have to apply for Social Security Disability determination. Prior to the 19th birthday, you don't need a Social Security Disability determination when seeking um, coverage by this waiver. Uh, so, for example, if you're someone who is already on this waiver and you're nearing your 19th birthday, um, you're going to need to get uh, to reapply for this waiver uh, through CanCare as an adult rather than from under your parents. And then also 
uh, you need to get that disability determination application going at the Social Security office if you haven't done that already. Um, if you don't get this done, you can lose your services once you hit 19. The Serious Emotional Disturbance Waiver, or the SED Waiver, this term refers to a diagnosed mental health condition and uh, that substantially disrupts a child's ability to function socially, academically, and or emotionally. This HCBS waiver serves ages 4 to 18 years of age. There are exceptions for children younger than 4 and there are extensions of services up to the age of 22. However, you must be under the age of 19 uh, to apply. Services provide special intensive support to children at risk of being removed from their homes or hospitalized due to severe emotional and behavioral difficulties. The Autism or AU waiver, services are provided to children diagnosed with autism, Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, and it serves from the age of diagnosis up to the age of six. Uh, clarification on that, the children can apply up until their sixth birthday. And then they don't age out at age six. What happens is whenever they begin receiving those services, those services are limited to three years. So if a child is diagnosed at age five and gets on the waiver, then he could um, have the waiver services up to age eight. However, there is an additional year that may be submitted for approval. An additional, um, that additional year may be available in some cases based on the review process. A lot of people ask why this is um, maybe only three years, possibly four years. Uh, why do kids age out so early? Kids don't really age out of autism, but this program is meant to be an opportunity for children with autism to receive an intensive early intervention treatment and for their primary caregivers to receive needed support through the respite services and for the children and their families it offers family adjustment counseling and parent support and training. The Technology Assisted or TA waiver serves children through the age of 21 who require substantial and ongoing daily care comparable to the care provided in a hospital serves those who are chronically ill or medically fragile and dependent upon one or more medical technologies or devices to compensate for the loss of a bodily function. They must also meet the nursing level of care requirements for their age group. So for example, this would be a child that was dependent upon mechanical ventilator or an intravenous administration of nutritional substances or drugs. The Brain Injury Waiver Program serves Kansas residents between the ages of 0 to 64. Must have a documented medical diagnosis of an acquired or traumatic brain injury that has caused a temporary or permanent impairment to their behavioral, cognitive, or physical functions and would otherwise require institutionalization in a TBI rehab facility. The BI waiver is a habilitative, rehabilitative, and independent living program with an emphasis on the development of new independent living skills and or relearning of lost independent living skills due to an acquired or traumatic brain injury. Participants who have a medically diagnosed brain injury receive intensive therapies and services based on the goals of the participant, their providers, and their managed care organization. Special note, brain injuries due to chromosomal or congenital diagnosis do not qualify for the brain injury waiver. BI waiver age clarifications for 65 and older. Individuals must be between the ages of 0 to 64 when uh, applying, but you don't just automatically age out of the program once you turn 65. The participant's progress will be evaluated every six months until they are no longer in need of these services or they reach a plateau in their progress and are able to transition to another waiver for ongoing supports. If you are age 65 or older and haven't applied for the BI waiver yet, you wouldn't be eligible, but you may be eligible for the frail elderly waiver. Some guidance on the youth brain injury waiver intake or entry. Participants aged 4 to 18 years of age uh, must 
do two things, submit medical documentation, uh, that's diagnostic documentation from a physician showing they have a qualifying brain injury. It cannot be a chromosomal or congenital in nature uh, to their local Aging and Disability Resource Center or ADRC. They must also complete the Youth Brain Injury Medicaid Functional Eligibility Instrument or the Youth BIMFEI assessment through the ADRC and of course meet the established level of criteria. For participants ages 0 through 3, they must submit the medical documentation showing they have a qualifying brain injury, again not chromosomal or congenital in nature, to their local ADRC, but they are not required to complete the youth BIMFEI assessment. The ADRC will then forward uh, the information they've received to the BI Waiver Program Manager for next steps. So a question you really need to ask yourself uh, is for, or for the individual that you're seeking uh, the waiver services for, are they in need of brain injury therapies? The Brain Injury Waiver Program eligibility is based on the need and ability to engage in the habilitation rehabilitation brain injury therapy services. So are you looking for the following therapies? Physical therapy, occupational, speech language, cognitive, or behavioral therapies. If the answer is yes, then you want to seek assessment for the brain injury waiver through your local ADRC. But if the individual is not in need of therapies, they are not eligible for the brain injury waiver program and you may wish to seek assessment for the IDD waiver instead which is the uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities waiver. If a brain injury is obtained prior to the age of 22 the individual may be considered developmentally disabled and have uh, or I'm sorry and be referred to the uh, CDDO or the Community Developmental Disability Organization for a functional assessment screening. CDDOs are required to assess all persons with developmental disabilities for the IDD waiver program. To be eligible for an HCBS waiver, um, there are three types of eligibility, functional eligibility, financial, and program. For functional eligibility, um, a functional assessment must be completed to determine if there is a medical need for the services. And then financial eligibility is going to be determined through CanCare. And then program eligibility, well each program has its own requirements that we kind of just went through. Um, age at the time of enrollment, determination of disability, different things. Uh, some programs may have a waiting list or a proposed recipient list. That means there must be an open space in the HCBS waiver program before they can actually begin receiving the HCBS waiver services. Let's look just at functional eligibility. A functional assessment must be completed to determine if there is a medical need for the services. Who you're going to contact to request this assessment depends on which waiver you're applying for. To know the point of entry for each waiver, let's see the following chart. When applying for functional eligibility for an HCBS waiver, this is where you um, have one of these organizations uh, assess you functionally to make sure you have the medical need for the waiver services. For the autism waiver, uh, you're going to start with uh, by submitting an online preliminary application at http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash ksau waiver or contact the autism program manager at 785 296-6843. KVC Health Systems does the functional assessment, but you will start with that preliminary application and contacting the Autism Program Manager. Um, for functional assessment for the IDD waiver, you would contact your local Community Developmental Disability Organization or CDDO. For the SED waiver, um, you would contact your local Community Mental Health Center. And actually, I believe that your local CMHC helps you to fill out the CanCare application online as well. The TA waiver 
Um, for functional, uh, functional eligibility assessment, you're going to go to your CRC or Children's Resource Connection of Kansas. And for the FE waiver, PD waiver, and the BI waiver, you're going to contact your, lo your local ADRC, um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, and tell them you need a functional assessment for whichever waiver you're applying for. Um, they'll come out to your home or to your residence and do that functional assessment and see if you have the medical need for those services. HCBS waiver waiting lists. Some of the HCBS waivers have a waiting list, so you may not be able to start receiving services right away, even if you have been found functionally eligible. Currently, there's a waiting list for the IDD and the PD waivers. If you meet functional eligibility, you will then be placed on the waiting list. Uh, your number on the waiting list does not determine when you will get an offer. Timing for offers are based on when funds are released. So a KDADS, which is Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services, uh, KDADS does not know and will not be able to tell you when the funds are actually released. You will be notified by mail by the uh, KDADS waiver program manager when a place on the waiver is open for you. It's important to keep your address current because the offer letter will not be forwarded. Remember, you always want to keep uh, your address and phone number current at the clearinghouse and also uh, with your uh, waiver manager if you're uh, waiting for a waiver, if you're on the waiting list. You will need to mail the completed offer letter back to KDADS within 15 days. For help with your offer letter, you can contact the appropriate HCBS waiver program manager. And your information will then go to KDHE, which is Kansas Department of Health and Environment, and to the KenCare Clearinghouse to confirm your HCBS Medicaid eligibility. What is crisis exception? Well, individuals who have already been found functionally eligible for an HCBS waiver, and that waiver has a wait list, may submit a crisis exception quest, request. They do have to meet certain criteria, and there is going to be documentation you're going to have to provide, but you would do that in the instance that you've been put on the wait list, and you are in a dire or dangerous situation, and those waiver services would actually help get you out of that dangerous situation. That's a time you would um, try to get around the wait, the, the, um, wait list. So one of the easiest ways to remember this for me is if you are in a crisis and can't wait, um, maybe there's an exception that can be made to not have to wait on the wait list. A crisis exception request may be submitted at any point during the individual's time on the wait list. Uh, the entity that does the functional assessment, so that would, for the PD waiver, um, that would be the ADRC, and for the IDD waiver, that would be the CDDO, they can assist you with completing the required documentation for the crisis exception requests, and they can talk to you about all that's involved with that. HCBS program managers cannot determine if an individual would be eligible for crisis exception unless this documentation has already been submitted. Proposed recipient list is similar to a waiting list. It's um, for the autism waiver. A child who has applied for and meets the autism waiver program criteria will be placed on the proposed recipient list. The child will receive a letter from the Autism Waiver Program Manager informing them that they have been placed on the proposed recipient list and their numerical position on the list. When a position on the program becomes available, the Program Manager will contact the family to offer them the potential position. Want to know more about a specific HCBS waiver program? The Waiver Program Managers um, are the people to contact. The, they can answer general questions about the program, program eligibility questions, and waitlist questions. Uh, how do you contact the HCBS waiver uh, program managers and also that agency that does the functional assessment for each waiver and also 
the one that can tell you about the crisis and exception for each waiver. There's a resource called Who Should I Call? It's a Medicaid-related resource for members and applicants uh, and those who are assisting them with Medicaid and can care questions. And it's um, on the left column, it talks about all the different questions and issues you may have. And on the right column, it tells you who it is you need to contact and um, gives you the information for that. So on, I believe it's the second page right now for that uh, resource, the HCBS waiver programs. It's got the program managers on there and it also has that point of entry, which is the agency that you can go to for the functional assessment and for crisis and exception questions. This resource will be available to you also, uh, again, at the end of this video, uh, there will be clear instructions on how to get to all these resources. Financial eligibility for the HCBS waivers. That is through CanCare, so you'll need to apply for CanCare to help pay for your services. Which CanCare application do I use to apply for HCBS? Whether you're a child or an adult, doesn't matter what age, the application you'll use is for uh, the elderly and persons with, with disabilities. And then the box you'll check check when it asks you which medical assistance program you're applying for will be HCBS. That is one of the seven HCBS waivers. And a clarification for children under 19. So the one application says families with children and that's the one that you use to apply for if you're applying for a child under 19. However, a uh, child under 19 will use the Families with Children application if applying for that Children's Medicaid or CHIP plan. However, if they are applying for the Medically Needy program or the Nursing Facility program or for an HCBS waiver program, then they're going to use the Elderly and Persons with Disabilities application. Financial eligibility for the HCBS waiver. To qualify for an HCBS waiver program through CanCare, applicants must meet the financial eligibility requirements, including income and resource asset limitations. Those uh, limits are $2,000 for single individuals, and there are special resource provisions, which is a division of assets for those individuals who have a spouse. Once you have been approved for functional eligibility for an HCBS waiver, CanCare will look only at the income and assets of the person who's going to be receiving services. So let me break this down into two examples. For child applicants, CanCare only counts the child's income and assets if looking at their financial eligibility for an HCBS waiver program. So if you were looking at that child for the CHIP program or the or just regular Medicaid program, they're going to look at the income and ask, uh, at the income of the child and their parents. But for an HCBS program, they're only going to look at the child's income. For adult applicants for HCBS, KDHE, which is Kansas Department of Health and Environment, will complete a division of assets first. Then they'll look only at the income and assets of the spouse who will be receiving HCBS services. And that spouse who's going to receive services is going to have to meet those income and resource and asset limitations. The out-of-pocket costs for HCBS. Like all CanCare programs, financial eligibility is based on income level. The current protected income level, or PIL, for HCBS is 1177. This means individuals on HCBS or with an HCBS waiver with income higher than 1177 a month must help pay for their care. They share the cost for their medical expenses through a monthly cost share called a client obligation. Total gross monthly income minus the protected income level equals the amount of the monthly client obligation. Um, that is their monthly cost share that they pay out of pocket for um, Medicaid and the HCBS services they receive. Let's look at an example, Frida's monthly client obligation. Frida's combined gross monthly income before any deductions 
from pension and social security benefits is $2,000. The protected income level for HCBS is $1,177. That is the amount of Frida's monthly income that is protected and cannot be spent toward her services. Uh, if you take 2000 which is her total month, gross monthly income, minus the protected income level of 1177 you can see that Frida has $823 per month to pay in a client obligation to receive her HCBS services and the, and the Medicaid that comes with that. She must pay this monthly cost share to her in-home service provider each month to continue to receive those waiver services. Let's do another example of how to calculate a monthly client obligation. Uh, Henry's gross monthly income is $864 per month before any deductions. The protected income level for HCBS is $1177. So again, that is the amount of his income that is protected and cannot be spent toward his HCBS services. Uh, because Henry's gross monthly income is not above that protected income level amount, he will actually have a zero client obligation. Henry's client obligation is zero. That will be his share of the cost for his in-home health services. And you can just look at the calculation. His total gross monthly income of 864 minus the protected income amount of 1177 um, does not give him an amount that he would pay, so it would be zero. Can I reduce my monthly client obligation? Uh, Ken Care members may be able to reduce the amount they owe on their client obligation or even on their spend down by submitting receipts for the members' medical costs that were not covered by insurance uh, to the Ken Care Clearinghouse. These would be the member's out-of-pocket medically necessary expenses. Examples of allowable expenses would be health insurance premiums or Medicare premiums or other expenses that Medicaid, Medicare, and other health insurance did not cover, but they were medically necessary and the member had to pay those out-of-pocket. Um, this is going to be true just for the member's non-covered medical expenses, not for other family members or other dependents. Um, be sure to contact uh, the clearinghouse and they are the ones that you would, would send those receipts to if you um, would like to see if you could get your client obligation reduced uh, due to those expenses. How to calculate the monthly client obligation? We've created a, a, a worksheet that can help um, you understand how to calculate the HCBS client obligation. This uh, worksheet can also be used to help understand the PACE participation obligation and how that's calculated. There's a completed example on the front and then a fill-in blank version on the back. Just running through, uh, through this worksheet from top to, vo to bottom, you can see that Mary uh, in that top box has two types of income, $1,300 from Social Security and $200 from pension. Added together, that's a total of $1,500 a month of her gross monthly income before any deductions. In the next box, it tells you that the protected income level for HCBS uh, is $1,177 a month. So in the next box, it's her income minus the protected income. So $1,500 minus $1,177 leaves Mary with $323 to pay each month for her HCBS services, um, but that is the amount before any allowable expenses. So let's say that Mary has $200 a month in a monthly insurance premium. She pays for other insurance to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Well, that would be considered an allowable expense. So looking at the very bottom box, we've got her income, $1,500, minus the protected income, $1,177, minus the $200 a month um, insurance premium she pays to Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is an allowable expense, equals $123. Now that is Mary's monthly client obligation um, 
after the protected income limit and after the allowable expenses. $123 a month is Mary's cost share for those HCBS services, or that is Mary's monthly client obligation. What if my gross income is 300% or more above the federal poverty level? So right now, um, if you'll see the note at the bottom, in 2019, 300% of the federal poverty level is 2,313. So that's the number we'll use to look at this calculation. What if my gross income is currently $2,313 a month or higher? Um, then the cost of care determination will apply to you. The expected monthly cost of your care which is going to be determined by the person-centered service plan that's set by the MCO, must be higher than your client obligation, or you may be ineligible for this program. However, if your gross monthly income is less than 300% of the current federal poverty level, which in 2019 happens to be $2,313 a month, then this cost of care determination does not apply to you. What if my income changes? You are required to report any income changes with the clearinghouse, whether it's an increase or a decrease, within 10 days of the time you learn of that change. If your income increases, the client obligation may also increase. If your monthly client obligation then exceeds your expected monthly cost of care determined by your MCO, you may no longer be eligible for the HCBS waiver program. If your income decreases, your client obligation may cha will change as well. You may now be responsible for a lower client obligation than before. If you do not update the clearinghouse with the uh, proof of the documented changes, you may not see a change in that client obligation amount. So a review of the HCBS eligibility process. After the applicant has been found functionally eligible by the agency that does the functional assessment, that's that point of entry, for, and there's a different one for each waiver, um, they, after they've been determined financially eligible for CAN care through KDHE, and they've met program eligibility guidelines through the KDADS program manager, and they've been informed of their monthly client obligation, uh, which is gonna, that, that number comes from KDHE, and they've decided to um, go ahead and get those services, they agree with the client obligation, what's next? Choose a managed care organization. So the next step is the CanCare member or applicant should make sure they've chosen the MCO that's best for them if they didn't already do that at the time of the application. How do you pick the MCO that's best for you? Well, ask yourself, do my favorite or critical providers participate in the network for this MCO? Ask your doctor, ask your providers which MCO they contract with. You don't want to have a favorite provider and then sign up for an MCO that doesn't contract with that provider. So talk to your providers and ask them which MCOs they contract with. Cont um, you could also contact the MCO directly and ask for a list of providers in their network. Um, I think if you already have a provider, it's best to talk directly to that provider because they may actually know if they are very soon no longer going to be contracting with a certain MCO. So if you already have a provider in mind, give that provider a call. Um, however, if you've lost your provider and you now need a new one that's within that network, that's a good reason to call the managed care organization and ask for a list of providers available in their network. Um, also, you wanna see which MCO has the value added services that fit your needs best. All three MCOs cover the same services except for these extra value added services. The extra services are different for each MCO. Where can I view the MCO differences? Check out the Benefits and Services webpage from the CanCare website. You'll see two PDFs there, one in English and one in Spanish, called the Value Added Services. Those are really the um, differences between the MCOs, the three MCOs, 
regarding which uh, difference in services they offer. These are services above and beyond regular Medicaid services that uh, differ between the three MCOs. So check out that chart and look for the things that are important to you. So look at the differences in dental between the three MCOs or look at the difference between pest control between the three MCOs or look at the difference between podiatry services between the three MCOs. You just kind of have to go through that chart and see which MCO fits your needs best. Also, to learn more about how to select or change your MCO, your managed care organization, see the Selecting and Changing MCOs fact sheet on the CanCare Ombudsman's website. The final steps are the person-centered service plan. After you've been found functionally, financially, and program eligible, and you've chosen the MCO that's best for you, that MCO is going to assign a care coordinator to the member who will meet with the individual and his or her family, if appropriate, to talk about their needs and the service options. The person-centered service plan is your individual plan of care. It's going to identify which services and amount of service hours that are appropriate to the individual. HCBS process review. Um, this is written out like everything's perfectly aligned and in order. Sometimes things will happen out of order. Maybe you've already got your CanCare application uh, turned in and then you find out you have to have a functional assessment. Those things happen, that's fine, but this is just a kind of a smooth look of, of how it can all unfold. Number one, uh, get your functional assessment. Uh, find out if you're functionally eligible, which means you have the medical need for those services on that waiver. Apply for financial eligibility through CanCare. You can even choose your MCO on the application. Meet the program eligibility guidelines. Of course, you gotta be the right age, the right diagnosis, et cetera, for whichever waiver you're applying for. Be informed of your monthly client obligation. That's your monthly cost share for those services. And then the MCO care coordinator is going to come to your home and do, or to your residence, and meet with the individual and his or her family, if appropriate, to determine their personal plan of care, which is called the person-centered service plan. When the MCO care coordinator is meeting with the individual to determine that uh, person-centered service plan, they will explain to them at that time uh, that they have a choice between agency-directed care and self-directed care for those in-home services. Now, some waivers don't allow for any self-directed care. Everything is agency-directed care. Other waivers allow for uh, some agency-directed care on certain services and self-directed care on other services. When you get self-directed care, you get to pick the person. It could be uh, a loved one that you want to um, provide those services for you. With agency-directed care, you pick the in-home health provider and they take care of uh, finding, selecting, hiring, training, and monitoring that staff. Uh, do keep in mind, if you do choose any self-directed services, you are responsible for finding, selecting, hiring, training, and monitoring that staff. Okay, so that would become your responsibility. Again, um, certain waivers allow self-directed. Other waivers only allow self-directed on certain services. And there's even some waivers out there that don't allow any self-directed care, except for upon exception and um needed situations when there is no other person that um, can provide those services. The person you would uh, talk to about those questions would be your MCO care coordinator. Want to learn more? Um, KDHE, uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, created the HCBS fact sheet. 
If you view, view this fact sheet online, you can click the different links to learn more about each of the HCBS waivers. This fact sheet, again, was created by Kansas Department of Health and Environment. That is the department that determines eligibility. Each link takes you to the KDADS HCBS webpage, and the KDADS is the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services, and that, um, so each one of those links takes you to that specific waivers program managers page. So uh, this is helpful in that way. Then there's the CanCare Ombudsman HCBS waiver fact sheets. These were created by the CanCare Ombudsman office uh, with the help of the HCBS waiver program managers and team. These fact sheets uh, were created for, with the beginner in mind and each covers a single HCBS waiver and its most frequently asked questions. So there's one fact sheet for each of the waivers. So you can print off just the uh, fact sheet for just the waiver that you need and it'll pretty much be an A to Z frequently asked questions and hopefully answers. And um, also who to contact for what type of question you may have. Where can I go to learn more about Medicaid related resources, ongoing education, and ongoing support? To find resources we've covered in these videos um, and additional Medicaid related resources, you can go to the CanCare website. Um, the direct URL for the CanCare website is https colon forward slash forward slash www.cancare.ks.gov. Then once you're on the CanCare website, look for the CanCare Ombudsman section in the toolbar to find the CanCare Ombudsman's webpage. The direct URL for the CanCare Ombudsman's webpage is https colon forward slash forward slash www.cancareombudsman.ks.gov. From the Ombudsman section of the CanCare website, next you'll go to the Resources page. That direct URL is https colon forward slash forward slash www.cancare.ks.gov forward slash CanCare hyphen Ombudsman hyphen office forward slash resources. When you click on that resources link on the Ombudsman section of the CanCare website, you'll see listed uh, all the resources we talked about here today um, and a lot of additional Medicaid related resources. Also on the CanCare Ombudsman's webpage, you can see the CanCare General Information Fact Sheets. To go directly to that uh, URL is https colon forward slash forward slash www.cancare.ks.gov forward slash cancare hyphen ombudsman hyphen office forward slash cancare hyphen general hyphen information hyphen fact hyphen sheets. When you click on that CanCare General Information Fact Sheets, uh, here is uh, an example of the page you'll see. Of course, we're constantly updating this and um, updating the information that's there and also adding more. Uh, so a lot of good resources here as well. Some of these we've mentioned in the video and some of these are additional resources. Also on that CanCare Ombudsman webpage, you can look for the community training link in the drop-down menu. Uh, the URL directly to that community training link is http colon forward slash forward slash www.cancare.ks.gov forward slash CanCare hyphen Ombudsman hyphen office forward slash volunteer hyphen program forward slash ongoing hyphen education. There, there will be uh, videos. Uh, these videos that you're watching right now are posted there and any updates we do to the videos or added videos will um, also go on this section. There's also, uh, if you'd like to register for in-person training, you can register for a class near you. 
If you're a CanCare applicant or member and you're needing help to resolve a CanCare issue, we are here to assist you. Also, if you're a provider assisting someone or a family member or a neighbor and you're trying to help a CanCare applicant or member, we are here to help you also. Give us a call. Our toll-free number is 1-855-643-8180. Again, that's 1-855-643-8180 or email us at cancare.ombudsman at ks.gov.